So, Mark, are you Mike? I'm Mike. Am okay. I? I am Mike. You're awesome. Mike. Awesome. And okay. I'm, oh. I'm uh, remoted. Okay. So, you see, it looks like you're going to talk about how to change the web. I'm going to talk about how we rebuild the web, the web that we want. So, what's the web that you want? I'm going to tell you. Can Good. I use some slides, or do you yes. want to just no, have no, a no. little debate? No, no, no. No, it's all yours. Okay. Thank you. Great. Hi. Thank you for having me here. Um, so, that is, in fact, what I want to talk about, rebuilding the web we want. And I love the web. It's you know, amazing to get to work for an organization where I get paid to love the web and rebuild it. And some of the things I love about the web are this. It's an amazing thing what we have every day that stupid idiots who make stuff like this, who are probably all of us, have an audience. We build a beautiful culture on the web. And I love it. But I also love what the web is deeply. This is a network map from the 90s. And the web and the internet still are this decentralized, beautiful, wonderful system in some ways that look like our brain. And so I want to tell you today that love story and about the kind of Lego and the underlying guts of the internet and why I love them and also about my kids who I love. So I want to tell you a love story. I also want to tell you a story about empowerment, because I think that's what the web is. Uh, and in particular, I want to talk about what Mozilla is doing to bring hundreds and, first of all, tens of millions of people and raise the kind of level of empowerment and literacy they have about what they can do with the web. But first, I want to tell you a story about power and how power almost broke the web, and how Firefox, which is now, as you may know if you've got a t-shirt coming to this phone, how Firefox shifted that power and brought the web back. So that's the first story I want to tell you. So I want to tell you this story about how we almost lost the web. So about 2003 is when Mozilla Foundation, which I run, uh, started. Um, and, you know, it was kind of a shitty year. The space shuttle blew up. Uh, not a happy moment. There also was a rocket here in Brazil that, that didn't take off. A lot of great minds were lost uh, and a lot of hope. Um, and, you know, probably more in Canada, where I'm from, than, than Brazil. We had SARS, we had this crazy global pandemic. It also was a year that was kind of shitty for the internet. Because if you were using the internet, it probably looked like this. Um, and it's not a joke. Because at that moment, 98% of people using the internet saw the internet through Microsoft's eyes. And when they saw it through Microsoft's eyes, you know, one thing, it was just crappier than it is now. I don't know how many people used webmail 10 years ago. Right? Put up your hand. If you remember, you had to hit reload, 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 reload. Right? And it looked like this. It was shitty. And, you know, the bigger thing, though, is in 2003, the web looked a lot like this. Online application is only available for Internet Explorer. We didn't have a cross-platform web. What we had built in the web, which was a platform that anyone could use across any, any device, was being broken by Microsoft's monopoly. And we forget that today, because we actually live in this world. This is, only goes to 2009, uh, and it's different even again now. But we live in this world where browser market share, which is what this represents, is actually quite diverse. right? How many people here use a browser other than Internet Explorer? I don't care if it's Firefox, right? You would not have done that in 2003. The world looked like this in 2003. The blue, of course, is Internet Explorer. Microsoft controls how we see the web. And HTML and CSS and JavaScript went kind of into fading. Right? I mean, they were taking it wherever they wanted. And that's where Mozilla comes in. Mozilla is a nonprofit, as you may know. Um, it's also a, an idealistic organization with a mission. 
it's not just a product organization that made Firefox because we thought we needed open source. It says right in our incorporation papers as a nonprofit that we exist to guard the open nature of the internet. And the founders of Mozilla set the organization up, started to make Firefox for that reason. And so our first project, of course, uh, was not to make a browser kind of in its own right, although that's what it became. It was to keep the core technical building blocks of the web alive. Microsoft is wrecking HTML. They're pushing ActiveX instead of JavaScript. If you're a developer, you know what that means. Developers were unhappy, and developers being unhappy also meant the web sucked. And so what we did as our first project in pursuit of that mission was build a browser that people would love. That's actually the radical coupling of Mozilla, right? The radical coupling is not that we wanted the web to be open. It's not that we made a great browser. It's that we did those two things together. We built in an idea about what the core building blocks of the web should be, HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, in their best form as cross-platform uh, you know, building blocks into a great consumer product people wanted. That was what Mozilla did in those dark days of 2003 and 2004. And we did it in a way that very few people had ever done. Is when Mozilla Foundation starts, it was actually a, well, first of all, when Mozilla Foundation starts, it's 10 people. 10 people taking on Microsoft. But it wasn't just 10 people, it was a huge community. And there's a funny story. There's a guy who works for us now, Tristan Nito, and he um, used to work at Netscape. He got laid off when AOL shut down Netscape. And he goes to one of these outplacement services where they kind of all sit around like in an AA circle and say, what am I going to do next with my career? And one guy says, oh, I'm going to learn how to be a chef. This other lady says, I'm going to be a librarian. I'm going to go back to school, get my master's. And he says, I'm going to start a nonprofit that's going to take on the biggest software company in the world and win. And everybody laughed. But we did it. We did it, and the success is in Firefox, the success is in Chrome, the success is in the web you see today. But how we did it was that. It wasn't those 10 people. This is a part of the, the Mozilla community here in Brazil, of which some of you are here in the audience. And this is the Mozilla community a few years ago at one of our summits. This is how we beat Microsoft. This is the leverage that loving the web and having a vision and then driving it into a consumer product can offer. And you probably can't read this, but it, it breaks down a little bit what that community looks like. You know, almost half a billion people using Firefox, but Thousands and tens of thousands of people actively giving every day still today to make this thing go. Because they love the web, because they want it to be open, and they want others to be able to build on it. So it's those people around the world of which you, how many people at least at some point in their life have used Firefox? Right? So you help move from that blue piece to 2009 and 2013, where we have a very different web. That's how we did it. And you can barely see this here, but you know, where we were in 2003 was, I actually, I just looked on my phone. And I said, what are the, the things on the web or the things on the internet that I use today? And there's a kind of faded out set of things that you can't see yet. You know, the only thing that existed in 2003 that I use every day is Wikipedia. But these other things I used, they didn't exist in 2003, and they didn't exist because the web was still too crappy for them. So what you enabled, what Firefox enabled, there's the Firefox over there, um, give him a round of applause. What he enabled and what you enabled was all of these things that we love on the web. And we also enabled, if you don't know what this is, it's the, the crappy HTML5 logo, we also enable just that the building blocks got better. And what that does is it means that we have what we need to get you in that lineup. How many people were in that lineup for shirts the other day? Right? Well, th th we'll have to come back with more shirts. Right? I can see the shirts, so that makes sense. So what us 
And you succeeding to bring the web platform back meant was that we can do what that was, getting people lined up with this Firefox OS phone and the shirts. Uh, we're now able to imagine an open world in mobile because we built that foundation. We are able to have those uh, amazing things like Gmail and Twitter because we have a platform that enables them. And this is a, a class from Wira, which is an entrepreneurship accelerator that Telefonica runs. What the web of today also enables is these people to start businesses, people in Brazil, people in every country around the world, based on the web. And the, where were we going in 2003 was a web much more controlled just by big companies and not by people, not by small entrepreneurs. And we brought that web back. We won it back. We also won back this web. People recognize that video, right? Uh, you know, I actually, I love that video. Um, and, you know, the thing is, the, the web where we all get to express ourselves, the web which is about us is the web we brought back. And I don't think that was the web that IE6 and a monopoly over how the web worked was going to give us. And it's also the web that I love. This is my son Tristan, who is a, a budding guitarist. You can go check him out on YouTube and Facebook. It gives him a chance to go and pursue what he wants to pursue in a way that I never could, and that maybe you never could. That's the web I love, and I think that's the web that Firefox and you brought back to life when it was really at risk. So, what am I talking about, this web that I love? What makes us love it so much? Clearly, all of that beauty of the, the dancing Psy SpongeBob and the, and the guitars and everything, and using these social networks and apps that you know, work as well as anything that used to work on the, the native desktop. Um, what's underneath that? And these are my two boys, Tristan, who you saw in the other one, and, and Ethan wearing the crazy Kiss t-shirt. Um, you know, what I love about the web is you know, playing with them on it. It is a part of their life and their culture. Um, but you know, what is that underneath, underneath? And I'm sorry, you can't read the gray stuff is, you know, what is so special about the, the web that me and my sons play with every day, that we all live on every day? And I would argue that what's special about it is it's made of a kind of Lego, unlike actually a lot of other things. Um, and so I'm going to use Ethan, who's my 11-year-old son, to explain this idea of the web being Lego, because it's really important, I think, in how we bring the web back, especially in mobile and in people's minds and people's hearts. So Ethan loves Lego. That's why he's holding it there. Um, and he also loves the web. And the version of the web that he loves, um, which is it's actually great to have a 10 and a 13-year-old, um, because I, I feel their relationship with the web every day. Uh, and the version of the web that he loves is this. Um, you know, it's not what I grew up with, which was watching mainstream TV and sitcoms. He doesn't do that. He watches YouTube all the time, and he brings me what's funny, right? It probably, you know, would have taken me weeks to discover Psy before my 11-year-old showed him to me. And of course, Psy is old news. But what Ethan also brings to me and what he loves about the web is exciting that I, you know, I also wouldn't see as I'm sitting out there doing Mozilla stuff, is, you know, this version of the web, and this version of the web, and this version of the web. You know, every day, this is what Ethan watches, and I get to watch it too, and I love it. To me, that's a fucking awesome culture that we've created. And it's a culture of remix, right? Ethan lives in a world of remix. We all live in a world of remix. And we have created a mainstream culture that is about people and empowerment and remix. And the thing about the web in that story, right, it's not that we've just gotten to this moment. Um, is that the web is remixed by design from its very deepest building blocks. And that's what Firefox brought back. And, you know, I would say, when I say by design, Tim Berners-Lee and the others who architected, you know, HTML and, and the HTTP in the beginning of the web built this idea of remix in by design. Talk 
love this video as much as I do. Um, but you know, what he built inside of what the architects of the web built inside of it is that it also worked this way. We have a mainstream media platform, business platform, everything platform that we live in every day where we can still view source, understand the components, and those core Lego blocks are the same whether I'm building a remix video, whether I'm building a business app, and whether I'm building Gmail. And I can see them, I can look under the hood, I can study them. All of those tenants of free software are actually baked in to the, the web platform. That is what is special about it, and it's why we've gotten what we've got. And it's what, also, Firefox stands for, stood for, and won. And so, the web was designed to be Lego. And I, you know, wh what I'm here to tell you is that Mozilla exists to keep this Lego alive, vibrant, growing. Um, but Mozilla also has another mission. Um, you know, certainly how we want to keep that alive and growing is with this phone that hopefully a year from now all of us will have in our pockets and that is made of the web. But the other thing Mozilla wants to do is make sure that Ethan and everybody who's Ethan's friend knows how the Lego works. And so that's another thing that Mozilla has taken on. So I'm not actually going to talk very much about Firefox OS and the phone. I want to talk about something called Mozilla WebMaker as well and in detail, which is we want to show the world how that Lego works to keep it alive and to give people the full power of the web. So. That's where the story turns to empowerment from love. Um, so if we go back, remember, 2003, crappy web, where are we with the Lego 10 years later? Well, I, I, oops, uh, where are we with the Lego 10 years later? And I, I showed you a bunch of the, the things in terms of where we're at. We feel them every day. We live in these social networks. We have awesome apps that work on the desktop web that are beautiful and are getting more inventive every day. We have cool HTML5 video. And we have uh, you know, new capabilities in the web platform. But we also have this, which not that it's not shiny and beautiful and I haven't owned one, but it's the internet wrapped up in a box with cellophane on it. It's the internet where there are platforms that uh, two companies control, distribution systems for apps, for books, for content, the two companies control, and uh, platforms where you can't see under the hood, where you can't view the source, that are not the same kind of Lego that we have made the web from. And in that, I mean, it's great. I love my Android phone. I love when I've had an iPhone. They're beautiful consumer devices. But they are consumer devices. They are not a platform that can work across everything. And they are not a platform that we can take apart and rebuild and shape ourselves. Um, and that's not just idealistic. Like, you know, I want the world to work like Lego. But the fact that the world has worked, works like Lego actually has generated a huge amount of creativity and wealth that I actually think the closed mobile platforms are standing in the way of. And so that's why we're making Firefox OS. Uh, and you can see in the corner you know, the, the little hint that it is HTML5. You can peel back the lid. And that's what we're trying to do with that platform and with that mascot over there. Um, and clearly, people are interested. We've got lineups. We've got people talking about being developers for Firefox OS. So I think that is going to help with the mobile world where we don't see that Lego, we don't see the full power of the web. But there's another issue which is just as big as those mobile platforms being closed, which frankly, you know, if you in 2003 said Firefox is going to have a quarter of the market share and HTML5 or like browsers that are really native to the web are going to be most of the browsers Nobody would have believed you that we would win, right? And I showed you how we did and that we did. And so I think we will, on Firefox OS, shape how the other platforms work. And we will live in a world five years from now where HTML5 is the dominant environment that people make mobile apps for and all apps. But there is another issue, um, which is 
as the internet becomes an increasingly important part of our lives, it's also an increasingly part, important part of our economy. And you can just see you know, the number of jobs created in businesses in Brazil where the web is infused into how they do business is more rapid and faster than those that don't. And that's increasingly how the economy works. It's going to be how our schools work. It's how our lives work, is the digital world is infused into it. Now, I don't have statistics on this from, from Brazil, but we work a lot in the UK on, on some of these topics. Um, and in that setting where the internet is important to our economy, to our life, um, you know, we actually have a great desire for people to understand how that Lego works. 67% of British kids age 8 to 15 say they're interested in learning how to code. 3% of them say they know. We have a huge gap. We have a huge gap between where the economy is going and what people want to know. And knowing how that Lego works is actually quite easy, right? View source, study it, play with it, make something funny, make something cool. That's how we all learn to do it. And so actually in that setting, I believe that it is just as important that we not only open up the mobile platforms, open up all of the web, bring it back to what it's meant to be. It's also important that we start to imagine that knowing how that Lego works is as important as reading, writing, and math. That we start to think that Mozilla's job is not only to keep the platform open, but it's to make sure people understand how to tap the full power of that open platform every day. And so this is a brand that I hope you will come to like and know as much as you know Firefox, which is Mozilla WebMaker. And its purpose is to help tens of millions, hundreds of millions of people move from being users of the web to makers on the web. And you may think I'm crazy when I say that. People just want to watch YouTube. They don't want to be makers. They don't want to code. But I actually, I think that's not true. I think people love the power that the web gives them. And when we explain and show them how easy it is to fully tap that, they will love it, and they will learn, and they will shape it. And so, sorry about the gray text here. It really sucks. Um, so how are we going to do that? What's WebMaker about? How are we going to move tens or hundreds of millions of people to being makers of the web? Well, we're going to show everyone the Lego, and we're going to do it all the time, and we're going to have fun doing it. That's what Mozilla WebMaker is about. I should bring my Psy video back here. But, you know, and, and so here at the moment is basically a website that offers some educational tools, uh, including organizing a community of mentors who teach people HTML and CSS and how to make cool stuff on the web. Um, we had about 600 events last, uh, you know, during the June to September period where mentors stepped up and helped us start Mozilla WebMaker teaching people how the web worked. There were even a, a few of those events in Brazil. I'll talk about more of those later. So one thing that Mozilla started is just a community of people who want to teach people how to make things on the web. The other thing we've started is to build a set of credentials, little badges that you'll be able to put on Facebook or LinkedIn or attach to your Mozilla persona account that say, I know how to do this. And more importantly, I made this. And so it's kind of like a, a typical education piece to what Mozilla wants to do with WebMaker. You'll get these WebMaker Mozilla badges and be able to say, Mozilla says, and my friends say, I know how to do this. But the real thing behind WebMaker is actually Psy and Remix. The thing that WebMaker stands for, the thing that I believe is as important as keeping the platform open, is that our everyday experience of the internet invites us to use the Lego and understand how it works. And so that's, we're actually embarking on creating products, creating a layer of social media where that is what we invite people to do every day, is play with the Lego. And so I'll give you two examples. I mean, this is still very early days. We've been in this WebMaker thing since last June. Um, but two products that we put out experimentally to test this idea of making people, ma making it easy to play with the Lego every day are uh, something called X-Ray Goggles and something called Popcorn. So X-Ray Goggles, as it says on here, is a way to see how the web works. And 
you know, what you see here is somebody using the x-ray goggles, and they hit remix, and it just brings up an abstracted piece of the code where I can just put in another image URL or whatever I want to do. And it also explains to me how that piece of Lego works. So the x-ray goggles are a way where, as I want to have a conversation about a set of memes, a set of slides, a set of web pages, I can hack them quickly in a way that is probably as easy and certainly is quite native in terms of moving content around the web with things like URLs. It's just as easy as using Facebook, but I'm seeing the Lego as I go. And we don't know yet whether that's the right way to do it or people will like that, but that's the concept, right? Get people to do things that are fun, that they do every day, and show them the Lego as they go. And kind of, you know, the other thing about the goggles is you can hack existing websites and say, you know, show a local copy. So I can go and change the Google website and put Cy as Batman there with those x-ray goggles. So that's one concept in terms of showing the Lego that Mozilla has with WebMaker. The other is this thing called Popcorn Maker, which I actually think potentially is going to be a real hit as a product. And what Popcorn Maker is, is basically something that looks like a video editor on the web, but it lets you make videos out of the stuff on the web as opposed to content on your hard drive. So it lets you take the URL of a YouTube video, the URL of a SoundCloud file, the URL of a picture, data from an API like Twitter uh, or Google Maps, and make a video in real, real time from stuff across the web. Make a video out of the Lego of the web. And so, do we have audio? We can't hear Cy. URLs of all these animated GIFs, you grab the URL of Cy, and those little cameras down there are just images that I've pasted in, um, you know, just as, as links. And so I now can create this layered video where the Lego of the web, uh, you know, pops together. I love the ponies. Um, ponies are awesome. Uh, with the Lego of the web becomes this new video right away. And that's the kind of thing we, w we think people will want to do every day, but also starts to show you, oh, it didn't really freeze frame for me, which is a shame. Um, but, you know, starts to show you that by using URLs, by taking the pieces of the web, it's made up of those Lego blocks. Uh, and also I can go and play with the code. So, Another thing, though, that we can maybe do with popcorn um, is start to collaborate around memes and social media. So you can't really hear it, but this is the Gangnam Style guitar cover on SoundCloud. And I'm just cutting the URL. I'm pasting it into Popcorn Maker. So now I've got that as my bed track for this video. And what I'm actually going to do is I'm going to do my own Gangnam Style video with my friends and our photos and make a slideshow against that. And when I share it on Facebook, one of the things that's different than how things like this work today is I can hit the remix button. So I'm in Facebook, I see a video, I made it of my friends, and I can throw my own baby, and actually this is my friend Brett's baby, into the video just with a cut and paste. And now I've forked the video, just like I forked the code on GitHub, and then share it back, or Brett shared it back, on his Tumblr blog. So the idea that we're getting at with some of these products is that the mainstream of everyday social media experience can be richer and funner if we build in the Lego of the web on the surface. That's what Mozilla WebMaker is aiming to do. And we're still early, but we think if we throw the right soccer content, the right memes, the right whatever into this, that this is stuff where the Lego of the web can be a part of everyone's everyday life. And of course, there's a question, so what? You know, so what if we get people making memes in a different way? So what if that's what Mozilla WebMaker does? Well, and, and also, so what, like, is this actually going to shift how tens or hundreds of millions of people understand the web? And part of the answer of why we believe it can is it's going to tie back to these other parts of what Mozilla is building, which is, as I share that video, as I make new things and change memes, I get to actually learn, earn these credentials. I get hints about what I'm learning. So imagine instead of earnest and boring computer classes, we're learning and being told how to use that Lego and getting feedback and getting credentials 
every time we use and play with social media? What if the way to teach tens or hundreds of millions of people how the web works is just to talk to them and add something new, a new set of feedback loops, a new set of capabilities into their everyday internet lives? That's what we want to do with WebMaker at the same time as we're out there rebuilding the web platform on mobile. And you know, a part of what's going to make that work is you uh, and people like this who are going to teach it. I mean, I think every day that social media stuff, people will just use at home. But there's also something powerful about going out there and sharing what the web can do, helping people play with that Lego. And so this is a, you know, one of those six or 700 workshops that happened last summer when we first invited mentors to come under the Mozilla WebMaker banner. And that's the map of those 700 events, which were in 80 countries. Um, and we're going to do that again, and we're going to do it bigger this year. So we're going to have tools coming out and social media content coming out this spring, which brings people into this WebMaker banner. We're going to have these badges, these credentials as a part of WebMaker. And we're going to invite you all to be part of teaching people how the web works under this WebMaker banner. And the, the way I want to close is you know, just to provide a, a bit of um, an example of why I think this can work. And why I think it can work and why I think um, we can win with this phone and why I think HTML5 can win on mobile is because we've done that before. Why I think we can build a global movement for web literacy and build that into our everyday internet lives is we've seen changes like that happen before. And so this is a, a you know, picture of some scouts camping. Um, oh, I just gave away my joke. And my joke is, you know, what do you think the major innovation is that scouting brought to the world? And the answer is civilian camping. 100 years ago, when scouting starts out, nobody camps unless they're in the army. Camping is an arcane technical activity. And it's only done by professionals, and it's only done by people who are trained, just like programming today. And you know, then how many people here have camped? Come on, there's tents in the next room. There's, there's got to be more people than that. Um, and, and so 100 years ago, you wouldn't have seen that. But how many people in the room are professional campers? Really? Awesome. So you know, it's still a smaller percentage than the total number of people who camp. And what scouting did was it took something that was arcane like programming is, and it brought it into the mainstream of our lives. And it brought it into being something that's simpler, that's easier to do, that you do for fun, that you do for leisure, that you do actually to connect with nature, which is actually a huge political outcome of the scouting movement that people care about the environment. Right? And the environmental movement is based a lot on that relationship that people have in nature because they go out and they camp. And you know, the thing is, they did that as a part of a movement that is still 40 million people strong, that's global, run by volunteers, and you know, just keeps itself going. And that's how they brought that idea, that technical idea, into the mainstream of society. So I take inspiration from that, because I think if we think back to 1907, we couldn't have imagined that camping was going to be a part of our everyday lives. It would have teed up the environmental movement the way that it has. And I think in 2013, it's hard to imagine that code is the fourth literacy that is something that everybody knows how to read and write. But I actually think it's just as possible. And I think the way we're going to make it possible is partly by keeping the web platform open like Lego is partly by making sure that that's the way the web works across all our devices and on our phones, and that the open web wins in mobile. But I actually also do think that the Mozilla communities around the world, that the entrepreneurs who actually are making connection between the social and the business side of the web, and that all of you have a role to play in helping make code being able to fully access the Lego that is the web, fun, easy, and a part of our everyday lives. And I think we get a better web and a better world when we do that. Thanks very much. 
And I guess I'm supposed to take questions. Pessoal, nós vamos fazer. Tem bastante tempo para perguntas, inclusive. Então nós vamos fazer. Os voluntários vão estar com os microfones, por favor. Levanta as mãos para o voluntário para te dar o microfone. Se for falar em inglês, avisa antes. Se for falar em português, ele vai ter o, tradu o tradutor, ok? Ah, so perfect. You can, you can hear the questions in Portuguese. Perfect. And some people who ask the question in English, they're going to say this before, so you have to take it off. Okay. Perfect. Okay. Well, I can do one. Oh. Or, yeah. If you're, if you're able to. Yeah, yeah. To hear the translation. Hi. In English. In English, okay. I will try. <laughs> uh, I'm from Natal, in the Northwest, and uh, we have a group, uh, if a student of HTML and JavaScript and other things, and we have a group of 100 person, but just uh, five uh, or about 10 people doing every day th this thing, and uh, we think about what we can do to uh, call everybody to love the web, how you're doing. So, I mean, I think that's exactly what we're trying to do is connect with people like you. And this webmaker movement is about giving you an advertising channel to call people to the web, a set of uh, marketing tools to organize events and organize courses, and a set of software and content, and this is the most important part, that make it kind of like sexy and interesting to learn about the web. Pardon? How do we make it sexy? With, with memes and with football. I think that's you know, the, the really important thing, right? Is if you go back to the very beginning of the slides, and maybe we'll just a good backdrop for answering these questions, right? That's what people love. And I think that you can let them do more of that by teaching them HTML, teaching them JavaScript to do stuff like that, right? Teaching them to do things that are fun or teaching them to do things that help their business. I mean, it's the practical things that we make that bring us to the web and connect us. So I think that's what we're trying to give you guys and everybody some tools to do that. So this summer, well, not summer, summer in the north, but this June to September, we're going to do a big campaign again. And so if you, yeah, everywhere in the world, so if you tweet me or email me, Twitter is at msermon or mark at mozillafoundation.org, we'll get you involved in that campaign and doing that. And also there's great Mozilla community people here who hopefully you can also connect to. Boa tarde. Uh, meu nome é Rafael Henrique de Andrade. E eu gostaria de saber qual a opinião da, Mo da Mozilla Foundation uh, sobre os projetos de lei SOPA e PIPA que aconteceram algum tempo atrás e que colocaram em risco a, a internet do jeito que a gente conhece hoje. Yeah. So, do, do, people, do people know what SOPA and PIPA are? No? Mostly. Okay, but I'll just explain. So, uh, you know, in the... In the U.S., there were these two laws called SOPA and PIPA that were going to uh, were very, very close to being passed. Uh, and like ACTA, which I think was less likely to be passed and was less likely to be an immediate threat, um, they included language that really was going to break the internet. In particular, it was going to break the DNS system because it was going to let people pull URLs out of the DNS system for copyright reasons. And so Mozilla's opinion was, don't break the internet. Uh, and so we, like everybody else who was sensible, uh, blacked out our website in protest and were successful in stopping that. And we mobilized a Mozilla community, as, as others did as well, to say, don't do this. Um, so our opinion is, you know, don't break the internet, don't have laws that break the internet. A, a more subtle part of this is, it's hard to know where law and lawmakers fit and where the internet just sort of evolving on its own fit in keeping the web open. Because um, I think you know, the, some of the things, if you're following the, the internet laws that are moving through the, um, the legislature here, there's some parts of that which I think are really positive in protecting how the web could work. 
um, but it's also getting watered down. And it's complicated because we live in a world where almost all policymakers never saw that, right? And so one of the things that we're starting to do is to go around and show side videos to policymakers, but actually, you know, help them understand why does the internet work the way it does? How is it made of Lego? How does that create wealth and jobs? Um, and so our opinion, uh, our action right now is to start working with policymakers so they really understand, oh, they like the outcomes of this. Uh, why does it work that way? Don't fuck it up. Boa tarde. Uh, queria agradecer pela palestra, que eu achei sensacional. E a minha pergunta tem a ver com a própria parte do SOPA, em referência ao SOPA e ao PIPA. No futuro, eh, quais são os desafios que você enxerga hoje referente a tanto privacidade quanto a confidencialidade que o tanto o Firefox OS quanto o, a visão da Mozilla referente à web que você, eh, vocês estão tentando enfrentar ou tem medo que possa acontecer? Something might happen specifically about privacy and security? Yeah, it's a, it's a, hard, it's a hard one, right? So Mozilla clearly has a long history and continues to stand up for people's privacy. And that's always been there in Firefox. It's in the way we think about Firefox OS. Sometimes it actually makes us go slower than competitors who care less about privacy. Um, but you know, absolutely, it's at the core of our belief system that you know, we should have control of our own data and be able to kind of keep, ha choose the level of privacy we want. On the flip side, the challenge is, you know, we live in a world where, you know, we're giving up our data about ourselves every day, every minute while we're sitting here and getting value from it, right? I mean, I use Facebook, which is a horrible thing for privacy and a horrible thing for the web um, because I get value from it with my friends, right? And I let Google and everybody else track me and all the ad trackers track me because I get value from it. And so there's this tension. If we just say, I want everything to be private, a lot of what we value in the web breaks. And the challenge is, how do we figure out how to continue to get the value we want, and also to be able to choose from moment to moment how much privacy I want, who I trust, and who I don't, right? If I'm saying something you know, to you uh, that I want to whisper, I just whisper a little bit. Whereas. You know, if I'm talking on stage, I project, and I don't think about that, right? I know when to be more private and when to be more public. We actually don't have good ways on the internet to do that yet. So, you know, what I would say is there's a lot of challenges for us in like, how do we keep our privacy, choose when to protect our, our privacy, and continue to get value from the fact that basically data is a big part of how the internet works and provides value. So that's one big challenge. Uh, and then the other is how do we build a user, you know, set of user experiences where it's easy to know when I want to be more or less private, which I think nobody has solved that yet. So I think those are two big challenges. But, and then, of course, the risk part of it is that there are some big crises in privacy that scare people, that get everybody to run back into a very, very, what feel like private places like Facebook, but really aren't. Uh, and I think that's a, a dangerous place that we sit right now. Hi. Here. Uh, can you speak a little, a uh, few words about the Aurora project and how it's related to Firefox? Uh, so which project? The, the WebMaker project? Or? Aurora. Oh, Aurora. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm, you know, Aurora is basically just an early release of Firefox that gets pushed to you all the time. And the same with Aurora on the, you know, on the phone. And basically, you know, the, the idea that we had was you know, traditionally we've had nightly testers who are like brave people who are using the most current build of Firefox from the open source, and it's, it's going to break a lot. And so those people help us find a lot of bugs, and they take a lot of risk and, and put up a lot of inconvenience. And so there's probably some people who are beta testers or nightly testers here. Then the other end you have the mainstream releases, which now come out on a regular cycle, but are, you know, far behind the cutting edge. Aurora was to come up with a middle ground between beta and release, where you can be more on the cutting edge, but with less kind of risk. It's basically just that version of Firefox, which is fresher features, a little less stable, um, but you know, not going to break all the time. Uh, 
uh, over there. Five more minutes. Okay. And because then we're gonna do the um, a, a Mozilla Foundation promotion here. Okay. Stage, so Perfect. We're gonna bring the, the mascot here. Right. Okay. Good. Bom, uh, Mark, uh, meu nome é Edilson, obrigado pela palestra, em Portugal, ok. Uh, eu recebi um tweet agora, uh, e eu acredito que seja uma dúvida... Uh, tá funcionando, is it working or not? Ah, there we go. Ok, good. Okay. Recebi um tweet agora há pouco, e me questionaram uma coisa que eu acredito que seja uma dúvida geral. Uh. Uh, em relação ao Chrome, é, muitas pessoas passaram a utilizar o Chrome por conta de velocidade. É, acharam que o Chrome era mais rápido. Tá? Então, é, o que você diria para todos nós, ou quem ainda tem dúvida de que o Firefox é superior ao Chrome, por que utilizar o, Chrome, o, o Firefox ao invés do Chrome? Ok. Eu acho que há duas coisas sobre essa pergunta. Uma é... Is... You know, I think that everybody knows, we know, there was a point where we, fell, where we fell behind Chrome in speed and a bunch of other things. I think if you come back to Firefox, you'll see that it's just as fast, that it still takes privacy more uh, seriously, that you've got more add-ons, um, and you know, soon that you're going to have compatibility with your device because it's all the web. Although that's also going to be true whatever browser you use, and that's the point. The bigger point is Chrome is our victory, right? Safari is our victory. HTML5 is our victory, right? We live in the world we wanted to create, which is that we don't, in fact, IE9 is our victory, right? That's what you, by using Firefox before, made, and that's what we made, is a true cross-platform, you know, a, a true platform that works on any device, which is HTML5. I don't actually care if you use Firefox. I care that the web is vibrant and that we keep enough market share to continue to push the web in the right direction. That's what we do. So maybe one more question. There was a guy there. Uh, English Mark. or Portuguese? Uh, no, English. How long do you think it will take for politicians really understand what the web is and start to making laws that sustain a healthy community? So it depends. Uh, if we can teach people who are 10 to 15 right now, how to make things on the web every day, and if WebMaker can be successful, 20 years. Uh, 20 years. Uh, it's, you know, and if we're not uh, successful, 40 years, 50 years, maybe we're not going to have the web left, right? And, but that's OK. Um, you know, John Lilly, who used to be my counterpart, who ran the, the Firefox product group, used to talk about how Mozilla needs to think of itself and all of you as a part of that as a hundred year organization. Uh, because the, the web is something that we're trying to infuse into our society and our culture that's going to last, right? And so it is going to take time for it to last. I often, when I try to look at corollaries for what we want to do, I, I talk about scouts, so that's a hundred year organization. I think we need to be thinking that way, thinking about generational shifts. I also talk about the Royal Society of Sciences in, in England, which really was, you know, amongst a lot of the early European scientists, a place that they gathered. And they weren't professional scientists, right? They were crazies, actually. Nobody thought science was real. Imagine that, right? Nobody thought science was something to take seriously. These guys were crazies. And they weren't professionals. They were people meeting in coffee houses. And They baked that set of ideas that we question, that we have critical thinking, that we use evidence into our society in a way that is deep and lasting. And they started that group, which still exists today, and I, I talk to them because they're interested in computer science and coding in schools. That group they started with that mission of baking critical thinking and science into society was started 352 years ago. That is the level we need to be thinking about taking the culture and values and architecture of the web and building it into our society. Because it's easy to lose with the politicians in five years or in 10 years. And we can go back to the power structure that we had before the web easily. Or, like science did, we can change the world forever. And I think that's possible, but it's going to take time. Hey, Mark. 
Can I bring a few friends to the stage? All right, bring the friends on the stage. Pessoal, é, eu só queria uma salva de palmas para o Mark, por favor. E vocês ficaram aqui até o final, o pessoal que saiu mais cedo perdeu, tá certo? Porque vai, ter, vai rolar uma promoção muito bacana aqui, que todo mundo aqui vai gostar. Eu queria chamar para o palco o Fábio, da Mozilla Foundation, o Davi, da Área de Desenvolvimento, acompanhado pelo mascote, do, o, o próprio Firefox.